everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are welcoming um, Lisa and Bridget uh, from the Office of uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, today, going to do a great uh, program on coronavirus scams, which um, I think is going to hit home for a lot of us. Um, we're going to uh, ask you to wait and uh, give us questions uh, through the chat room. You can do it. I'll combine them. Um, Lisa, I believe, will be leading, take the lead um, as far as the presentation, and we'll hold the questions till the end, and we'll try to get through them as expeditiously as possible. But please go ahead and mute yourselves to give our speakers uh, the full uh, floor. So without further ado, Lisa, Bridget, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thanks, Barbara. Thanks so much for having us. Um, and thanks for inviting the CFPB and the FTC to talk about COVID scams, older adults, and financial protection. And thanks to all of you who are working in the Village to Village Network, helping older adults to age in place. Um, my name is Lisa Schifferly. I'm a senior policy analyst in the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. And I'm gonna talk about some of the COVID-related scams that we're seeing and tell you about CFPB resources that we hope will help you avoid and respond to scams. And then after that, Bridget Small, who you see here as well, um, she is from the Federal Trade Commission's Division of Consumer and Budget Business Education, and she's gonna share some tips and resources from the FTC. And then we will both be happy to answer your questions at the end. Now, before I begin with my presentation, I need to give you this disclaimer, which is just to say that Anything I say is my opinion and not necessarily the opinion of the Bureau. So let me start by telling you a little bit about the CFPB's Office for Older Americans in case you're not familiar with us. The CFPB is a national consumer protection agency and the Office for Older Americans where I work. Um, we develop resources to help protect older consumers from financial harm and also to help older consumers make sound financial decisions as they age. So you can find all our materials at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. And today I'm gonna to focus on some of our COVID related resources for older adults. And of course, the big issue with COVID right now is COVID vaccines. Um, I'm gonna tell you about some of the scams we're seeing and Right now, since the news is all about COVID vaccines, uh, the big news is also about COVID vaccine scams. With the difficulty getting the vaccine, scammers are trying to lure people in with promises of early access. So to avoid vaccine scams, this slide has a few tips for you to share and pass on in your community. The first is to let people know, do not pay for promises of early access to the vaccine. That's a scam. Also, don't give personal information like social security numbers, bank or credit card numbers to someone who calls promising to get you a vaccine for a fee. Also, it's really important to remember that if you are on Medicare, the vaccine is totally free. So for most older adults, there should be no cost whatsoever. For those that are not on Medicare, the vaccine itself is still free, but there may be an administrative cost for administering the shot. Some insurance plans are covering that admin fee too, um, but you may have an admin cost if you're not on Medicare. But if you are on Medicare, it's really important to spread the word that the vaccines are totally free. So anyone asking you to pay for a vaccine if you're on Medicare, that is a scam. Now we're also seeing a variety of other healthcare related scams related to the pandemic. Some of them relate to test kit offers uh, there used to be no test kits on the market, so we could say that any test kit offers were a scam. Now the FDA has authorized some home testing kits, but there are still scammers calling people and claiming that they are from Medicare, and they ask for your social security number in order to send you what they say is a free home test kit. That is a scam. Uh, it's important to check with your local department of health for legitimate testing centers and I know that yeah yeah I think they oh someone's not on mute if everyone who's not speaking could remain on mute that would be great um, so it is important to check with your department of health for legitimate testing centers and I know the villages at least in my community have been very helpful in connecting 
people with resources for vaccines and legitimate testing centers. Another type of scam we're seeing are air filter systems. Um, some people are claiming to offer air filter systems that they say are designed to remove COVID-19 from the air in your home. So if you receive a phone call, email, text message, or letter with claims to sell you any of these types of air filter systems, that is a don't pay for that. And contact tracing is another big issue of coronavirus-related scams, a graphic which is actually from the FTC where Bridget works, and that talks about contact tracing scams. And what's going on and here is that scammers are pretending to be conscious in order to try to get your personal information. So they call you and they say, or sometimes they text you, these are increasing scams, but they say that you've been exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID and then they ask for your personal information or your money. So to spot a scam in real attack tracing, it's important to keep in mind that real con Contact tracers will not ask for money. They will not ask for your bank or credit card numbers. They also won't ask for your immigration status. Now, another type of scam that we're seeing uh, increase during the pandemic are government imposter scams. And these come in a number of different varieties. Uh, and then we hope you'll spread the word about all of these scams so that people in your community can know how to recognize them and avoid them. So with these government imposters, there are social security or Medicare related scams where you may get a call, as I said before, that claims to give you special access to testing or treatments or vaccines, but those are scams. Social security and Medicare are not offering special access for coronavirus tests or treatments. So if you get a call like that, please just hang up. And remember when you get a call, even if caller ID says that it is from a government agency, that can be spoofed, so don't trust the caller ID. If someone calls you, don't give out your personal information or give money. You should call back in a number that you know to be correct. Now, there are also scams related to the economic impact payments, or EIPs, and even to COVID-related unemployment benefits. Some older adults report getting prepaid cards in the mail for benefits they didn't apply for or sometimes didn't even qualify for. Uh, and in fact, the FTC has reported that ID theft or identity theft complaints doubled between 2019 and 2020. And at least part of that is attributable to unemployment and EIP related identity theft. So this slide gives you some tips about how to avoid government imposter scams. First, keep in mind that the government will not call about expediting your EIP or economic impact payment. That's a scam if you get a call like that. Second, if you do need to go to a government website, visit it directly by typing the name into your browser rather than by clicking on links in text or emails. Those links, if you click on them, could download malware on your computer, which allows uh, scammers to get into your personal information on your device. So try not to click on any links in text or emails uh, that you get unsolicited. Third, remember the government will not ask for cash, gift cards, wire transfers, or cryptocurrency. Those are not methods of payment that the government takes. So if someone calls claiming to be from the government and asking for payment in one of those ways, that's also a scam. Now, another type of scam I want to let you know about are what we call errand helper scams. Now, a lot of people who are um, trying to reduce their exposure to the virus are staying indoors and having other people do errands for them. Um, lucky for village to village members, you often have village uh, volunteers to help you with this so that you don't get scammed. Um, but there are people who sometimes have to hire an errand helper um, and then that person may run off with the money and never do the errands. So, if you're an older adult, um, try to find a trusted friend or neighbor, or I imagine you can contact your village too for help with errands. Um, if you order online, use a trusted seller. And if you are a caregiver for an older person, then it's important to check in by phone or video chat and look for warning signs of scams. 
Also, if you do need help finding trusted help, in addition to the villages, a great resource is the Elder Care Locator, which you can find at eldercare.acl.gov or 1-800-677-1116. Now, I've talked a bit about a lot of the scams that we're seeing during the pandemic. I want to also discuss a bit about the financial impact of the pandemic because many people during the pandemic are having trouble keeping up with bills, whether it's housing bills, mortgage bills, credit card bills, uh, any and all types of bills. The important thing to know if you're having trouble paying on time is to contact your lenders, loan servicers, and other creditors. Uh, many credit card companies and lenders are offering options to help you. This could include waiving certain fees like ATM fees, overdraft fees, late fees, um, or allowing you to delay, adjust, or skip some payments. So it is important to reach out to them. You should be prepared when you reach out to them to explain things like your financial and employment situation, how much you can afford to pay, when you can start regular payments again, and also talk about your income, expenses, and assets, and tell them that you are experiencing financial hardship due to COVID-19, if that is the case, because a lot of places are offering flexibilities in terms of payment plans when you have a COVID-19 related financial hardship. Now, I want to talk about mortgage relief options because we know that there is a large proportion of the country right now that is behind on its mortgage. Um, so we have developed some great new resources at consumerfinance.gov housing. This is what it will look like when you go to that website. It includes this video about forbearances and it has a lot of options for what to do if you are behind on your mortgage. And for starters, you should know that if you are behind on your mortgage, you're not alone. There are a lot of people in that position. And for especially for older adults who want to age in place, um, this can be particularly distressing. But fortunately, there are several protections under the CARES Act and which government agencies have extended even new CARES Act legislation. So, there are two big things you should know about. Um, but first, if you can pay your mortgage, you should continue to pay it. But if you can't, the most important thing, again, is to contact your mortgage servicer immediately. Um, before I was at CFPB, I was at FTC, but also I was a legal services attorney. Um, and I know oftentimes when people get behind, they kind of bury their head. And the important thing to do right now, especially during the pandemic, is to reach out and call your servicer or call the, in order to work something out. So like I said, there are two big provisions now that give some protection. If you have a federally backed mortgage, it's federally backed again, you can go to that website I mentioned, Consumer Finance.gov slash housing. We have a tool there who is backing your mortgage. But the first thing there is, is a foreclosure moratoria. So if your loan is backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, then you cannot be foreclosed upon until after March this year. If your loan is backed by HUD, FHA, USDA, or the VA, then you 30th of this year. So that's one protection for people to know about. And second, and very importantly, is the forbearance option. Forbearance is, if you're not familiar with the term, it's basically when your mortgage servicer or lender allows you to temporarily pay your mortgage at a lower payment rate or to pause paying your mortgage for a period of time. And with COVID related forbearance, there'll be no additional fees, penalties, or interest beyond the scheduled amounts added to your account. So you also don't need to submit any additional documentation to qualify. You just have to assert that you have pandemic related financial hardship. You don't have to actually prove that with documentation. But if you are facing a pandemic related hardship or you know someone who is, they should ask for the forbearance immediately so they don't lose that right. 
So there are some important deadlines to keep in mind. You can find them all at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. So don't worry if you don't get them all right now, they're all there on the website. But if you do have Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, then there's a deadline at the end of February, February 28th, so just a few more days in order to request a forbearance. If you've requested your initial one by then, then you can renew that 180 day forbearance for up to 15 months, but that has to be done by the end of February. So that's very important if you have Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. For those who have a HUD, USDA or VA loan and are behind, they have until the end of June to request a forbearance and they can get up to 18 months of forbearance. Now, you may be wondering, well, what if I don't have a federally backed mortgage? Am I just, you know, up a creek? But uh, no, you should still call your servicer. Many servicers are offering similar provisions to these and, you know, talk to them about forbearance related options that they have. Um, and again, there's a lot more interest information at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. Um, this slide explains a little bit about forbearance because it is a really important thing for people to know about right now in order to be able to stay in their homes if they're behind on their mortgages. Like I said, uh, forbearance is when your lender allows you to temporarily pay your mortgage at a lower payment or pause paying your mortgage. Um, you will have to pay the payment reduction or the pause payments back later. Um, usually at the end of the term of the loan, but forbearance can help you with deal with a hardship. It sometimes is used like if a home is flood or if you had an illness or injury um, that increased your health care costs and that made it hard for you to pay your mortgage or if you were working and lost your job. Um, now a lot of people are using it because of the pandemic, but it's a good tool to know about, you know, in other circumstances that may arise as well. Uh, and also if somebody is a renter that you know who is behind on their rent and worried about being put out, uh, they should check the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has an order in effect that pauses evictions through March 31st of this year. And there is a form on there that you can present to your landlord to say that you're having a COVID related uh, financial issue in terms of paying your rent. Now, in addition to housing, people may have all sorts of other debts that they are dealing with uh, right now. So if you currently have a debt in collections, um, there's a website at the bottom here, our Consumer Tools Debt Collection site, that gives you uh, some tools and information about how to work with collectors to identify a realistic repayment plan. It's also good to know your rights about uh, dealing with debt. There's a federal law called the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, which says that a debt collector cannot use unfair practices to collect the debt. So that means they can't misrepresent about the debt, including the amount owed. They can't falsely claim the person contacting you as attorney. They can't do things like threaten to have you arrested or threaten to do things that can't be legally done. So um, basically they're not allowed to harass you. So this is a very important uh, tool to know about. And if you do sue under the federal law and win, the debt collector has to pay your attorney's fees and may also have to pay you damages. Now, also remember when you're looking to settle your debt, there are a lot of these debt settlement companies, um, but it is important to be cautious when using debt settlement companies because you could end up worse off than you were when you started, uh, deeper in debt than you were when you started if you end up with an illegitimate debt settlement or debt relief company. So it's important to work with a nonprofit credit counselor, a certified counselor, and negotiate directly with a creditor or debt collector yourself. Again, there's more information on this on the website at the bottom of this slide. I also wanna mention, um, some information about protecting your credit because when you're behind on your bills, then that can affect your credit. And due to COVID-19, there is now special provision which allows you to get free weekly credit reports at annualcreditreport.com until April of this year. Now, normally you can get free annual credit reports um, once a year from each of the big three credit reporting agencies. Now you can get them weekly. Um, the most important thing to know is to just 
check your credit after, especially after you've made some sort of agreement like a forbearance or a debt payment arrangement uh, to make sure that it is properly attributed on your credit report. The CARES Act does place special requirements on companies that report your payments, um, especially when there's been a CARES Act or coronavirus related uh, settlement that has been reached. If you on your payment at the time that you reached that, that agreement, then your payment should as delinquent on your credit report. So it's important to routinely check your credit reports to make sure that the creditors are properly reflecting any agreements and then to dispute any inaccurate information. Um, and the CFPB has information on how to do the dispute information with the credit reporting company. And then of course, If the dispute uh, you're not satisfied, you can file a complaint with the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. And I'll give that information again at the end of my presentation. But I do want to some resources that the CFPB has, especially for older Americans. You can find all towards older people at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. If you want to go straight to our coronavirus resources to learn more about all the scams and financial protections that I talked about today, the best site to get you to that are consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. And if you want to go right to the housing resources, again, that's consumerfinance.gov slash housing. And um, this is our unified housing site with a bunch of other federal agencies to tell you about mortgage and rental protections. Also, for those of you who are going out in your own communities and sharing information about scams, I hope you'll share what we are telling you on this webinar. But in addition to that, we also have a publication called Money Smart for Older Adults. It's a comprehensive awareness program that the CFPB developed with the FDIC, and it focuses on preventing elder financial exploitation it offers over two hours of content on particular scams and types of theft targeting older people. And if you want to offer training, it's really plug and play. We have an instructor guide that scripts a presentation. There's a slide deck and a participant resource guide as well. Um, it's all in 14 point font too, to make it very readable. And again, you can find this and all our other materials at consumerfinance.gov. We also have these fraud prevention placemats. These were originally designed um, for Meals on Wheels and those types of uh, meal distribution centers to give people a placemat. It's actually a paper placemat that goes under your plate and your food with a fraud prevention message. Um, what we found is that these became so popular that all sorts of places were ordering them outside of meal delivery places to use them as activity sheets or posters in their community. So you're welcome to order these as well. They're available in English and Spanish at consumerfinance.gov slash placemats. They cover all sorts of things from disaster preparedness scams um, to online safety to romance scams and identity theft. So we encourage you to check those out as well. Um, we also have a series of guides that may be helpful to any of you who may be acting as a financial caregiver and managing money or property for a loved one who's unable to do so. Um, and we know that during the pandemic, more people may be called upon to act as care financial caregivers. So what these guides do is help financial caregivers recognize scams and avoid fraud and help people understand their duties, like how to protect, invest, and manage money for someone else, depending on whether they are an agent under power of attorney, a guardian, a trustee, or a government fiduciary. So those are a bunch of the resources I wanted to share. And I did want to mention, of course, everything that I've talked about that's coronavirus related, the place to go is consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. And if you do have a problem with a financial product or service, 
You can submit a complaint online to the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. We do encourage people to first try to reach out to the company, um, but if the company does not resolve the complaint, then you can file a complaint with us. And we usually work to get a response from the company within 15 days. And um, so then you can hear back from the company to confirm what you have heard or to further uh, work on your complaint. So do, if you have an issue, consider filing with consumerfinance.gov slash complaint. Uh, and so as the pandemic situation evolves, we will continue to update our consumerfinance.gov coronavirus website. So we encourage you to check back for updates. Um, and I will be happy to answer your questions at the end, but for now I'll turn it over to Bridget, who has some resources and updates from the FTC. So Bridget. Thanks, Lisa. And you're gonna advance my slides for me? Yeah. Okay. So hello everyone. I'm Bridget Small from the Federal Trade Commission. I'm with the Division of Consumer and Business Education. Next slide. Um, and I want to say that my views, um, my presentation reflects my views and not necessarily those of the FTC or any individual commissioner. Next. Um, and I will talk about a couple um, specific scams, but before I do that, I wanna talk just about scams and scammers in general, because so many of the things that we talk about um, have some common threads in them. And if we can prepare for those, um, you, you start to see the patterns and they're actually things that you've seen before. Um, scammers want your money or your information, which they can use to get money. They want your social security number or your bank or your credit card. Um, and their stories change, but their motivation doesn't. They keep wanting the same things. You've probably seen their tricks before. You've gotten calls. Um, from the IRS agents, or you've heard the story of the Nigerian prince who give you millions if you'll send him thousands, or you've gotten, um, you know, someone knocking on your door saying, hey, I was just in the neighborhood and can I check your roof for leaks or can I check your basement to make sure it's dry? These are things that you've seen before. And you're familiar with them. Distract us. Scammers often want to make us emotional. Um, to get us excited about the prospect of winning. Think about the car, the vacation, the terrific thing that we're going to win, or to make us afraid and worry that the social security number is going to be frozen or the grandchild to distract us with emotion so we won't think about the scam. And they're trying to pull on us to get our money. And when you must make you emotional, if it does um, start to distract you, it's good to stop and think, who's contacting me? Who is this message from? And what do they want me to do? Really, what's the evidence behind this message? And then it's okay to do some fact checking to call in your village, go online, check with the FTC or the CFPB, check with sources that you trust and find out what's really going on before you, if you find yourself just reacting to something. And when you do find something is wrong, let, that, let someone else know, share that news, because that's the way um, agencies like the FTC and the CFPB and the people around you are, are better able to protect each other. Next slide. And one of the FTC's most important jobs along with education and outreach is enforcement. And the way we find out many information for many of our cases is we get reports and complaints from people throughout the year. So we get consumer reports, and I'm gonna give you the address for that, um, the way to give us reports and complaints and tell us what's happening. So throughout the year, people tell us what has happened to them. And, and at the end of the year, we publish a summary of what people have told us. Some people report scams and frauds, things that they observe that just didn't look right. 
Some people also tell us how they've lost money. And we'll talk about that in a second. But here's a summary of some of the things people reported in 2020. And you can see that there were 2.2 million reports of fraud. Imposter scams were the top fraud complaint. And Lisa talked about some of those. The imposter scam includes different kinds of imposters, government imposters, grandparent scam callers. Um, maybe you got the fake Amazon call that said, or the text that said, your account has been charged $400, press one to stop this call, and it's nonsense. Problems with online shopping were the second most reported, and a lot of that relates to COVID. Because, you know, last year, a lot of people were shopping online. They didn't want to leave the house. We wanted masks. We wanted cleaning supplies. We were ordering all kinds of things online. And many of those things, you know, came late. They didn't come at all. They weren't what people ordered. You know, things were charged wrong. So that's where those complaints came from. If you look at the identity theft category, this is something Lisa also mentioned, the top number of complaints were related to government documents and benefits. And many of those complaints were related to people who had problems with their stimulus checks, who found that their stimulus checks went to the wrong person, to the wrong bank account, or they suspected that it went to the wrong person or the wrong bank account. And then later in the year, people found that other people were claiming unemployment with their information. So there was identity theft related to unemployment benefits. Next slide. And as I said, sometimes people have the option of telling us how much money they lost. And we've learned over the years that fraud affects people differently at different ages. And this is a, a small example of that. If you look at the information on the top line, that's on, it's about online shopping and the amount of people, excuse me, the amount of money this is the median amount of loss. We calculate the median amount of loss for people at different ages. So if you look at the top line, you see that people who lost money to online shopping, this is all in 2020, I should say this, whether they were in their 30s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, lost you know, about the same amount of money, median amount of money. So it's around $100. That's, you know, ballpark. If you look at the second line, you see that people who lost money to prize and lottery scams, there's a difference there. Someone in their 30s, the median amount of money lost was $300. But for someone in their 70s, the median amount of money lost in the last box on that second line is $3,000, 10 times as much. And then if you drop down to the last row there, romance scams. Someone in their 30s, the median amount of money lost was about $1,500. But for someone in their 70s, the median amount of money lost was four times that, more than $7,000. And that, oh, go back, Lisa. Thank you. So that, that difference in the amount of money lost by people at different ages is something that the FTC is very aware of, that different financial impact of people at different ages. And a lot of our education and outreach and our enforcement is working to help change that, you know, focused on educating and reaching out to people and, you know, enforcing different cases that target or have a disparate impact on people at different ages. Next slide, please. Okay. So from the general to the specific. Now, looking at some of the, again, one of the things where there's a financial impact and things that are related to COVID, you know, people who are looking for different ways to work or different work may be looking to work at home or earn different money working at home. So if you are looking for work, whether you're just generally looking to maybe start an online business or join an online business, or you put your um, resume up online, you may have seen these ads that say, you know, we've got a proven system. We can help you get started. You can, you can sell leads online. You can start an online shipping business. You can do a lot of different things online. 
And there are a lot of different companies, but many of them are scams, making these offers online. And there are places you can post your resume online. And we've heard from a lot of people who get answers and they post their resumes like, great, we want to interview you. Send us a copy of your license and your credit card. We need to start processing. We're going to in-process you. We're going to start the paperwork right away. We haven't even met you. We haven't even talked to you, but we want all your information because we're going to get you started. Eh, not so much. Next slide, please. You know, you don't want to send anybody your personal information before you've interviewed with them. You want to check before you check their name online. You can search online with a name and just hit enter. See what comes up. Or check with the attorney general in your state or the attorney general in the state where the business has a headquarters. If you give that personal interview, personal information during the so-called interview or ahead of it, somebody can take off with that information and commit identity theft. It's not a good idea. There's also a type of job scam where somebody says, we want to hire you. We're sending you a check. We want you to buy the computer equipment to set yourself up. Here's a check, cash it. Go ahead and send the money to buy the uh, computer equipment. And um, you know, keep two hundred dollars for yourself. Well, the check, the, the check that you just deposited in your account is a bad check, and the money you've just sent to the computer guy is money that came out of your account. That's a fake check scam. So you want to be very careful if you get offered someone to to send you a big check, someone that you've never had any dealings with before, to send you a big check to cash and send to someone else. And as far as those proven training systems, proven system, the training and the support the FTC has seen through, through its investigations and cases, that a lot of those special systems and training turns into kind of an, an ongoing endless loop where you get upsold to, and pressured to keep on buying additional systems and additional training. And that's why it's really important to do the investigation in advance to find out before you invest money or time. And there are legitimate places to look for work. For example, the career one stop for your state. Next slide, please. Okay, and we're, we're coming back to where we started, where Lisa started on vaccine scams, you know, something many of us are thinking about. And I'll repeat what she said. Um, while you're waiting for a vaccine, if that's something you want, it's important to protect your information. Um, we've already heard from people who saw fake online enrollment, somebody who got a, a, a text that said, you know, stop COVID now, give me your social security number, um, it was a scam. If you get anything that asks for your sensitive information, that's not how you sign up. If anyone asks for money for any step of enrollment, that's not how it works. It's just not. If you want information, contact a source you trust, contact your healthcare provider, pharmacy, um, or your state health department. You can get that contact information at cdc.gov. Next slide. Um, this repeats that information and it, this shows you um, a very small image of a poster that we have. This is something um, that I'll explain in the chat, how you can get this image and if you share things through social media or if you print things and hang them up on a community bulletin board or places where you share information, um, it's a great thing to have because you can repeat, you know, you can share this information and, and share it out in the world and just let other people know how to avoid the scam. Next slide. Okay, report problems. This is another way we really ask people to help. Um, the blue box on the left is reportfraud.ftc.gov. That's where we need to get the stories and reports about frauds and scams and bad business practices that you see out there in the world. And we encourage you to tell us what's happening. It's an online site. You can give as much or as little information as you want. Um, whether you lost money or didn't lose, lose money, want to give your name and contact information or don't, uh, you can do it for yourself. You can do it for someone else, but we really need that information. That's what helps 
the FTC and all the law enforcement agencies that use the database to start investigations. And the other address there, identitytheft.gov, is where you can report problems with your personal identity information, social security numbers, um, other compromises of your identity information. When you do that, you'll get a personal recovery plan and an identity theft report, and then create pre-filled forms that use your information and letters that you can send to credit bureaus and debt collection, debt collectors, excuse me, um, to help resolve those problems that you have. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some addresses where to get additional information. I'll put these in the chat, but this tells you where to go to learn more, how you can sign up, to keep getting information from the FTC. We put out blogs two or three times a week with new information about scams, FTC cases, um, FTC refunds that are going out, and then the address where to go to read our articles. And I think I've got one more, Lisa. There we go. Oh, free material. When we get to that part of life where we're you know, giving out <laughs> material again and sharing things in public, or if you just like to have things now, you can order free print publications. Um, this shows you some topics I haven't talked about. Identity theft, these are uh, things that we have. Identity theft publications, that's a pamphlet. Paying final respects is information about your rights when you're uh, buying funeral goods and services. There's a fact sheet on healthcare scams, a brochure for small business owners, protecting against scams, and then a photo novella. We have a series of those colorful graphic novels for Spanish speakers. And that's my last slide. Thank you for listening. <sighs> and we've saved some time for questions even. Yay. Hey, um, how you've teed up the questions for us. So I've left, um the chat box open. We haven't had much um, as far as questions. We did have one, Lisa, that I, I about in the News Cares Act or, or some of the, these deadlines could be moved. Yes, it's quite possible. Right now, the federal government agencies have extended the deadlines in the absence of congressional legislation. So those dates that'll be right at the end of March for some, the end of June for others could be extended by depending what passes Congress. Okay, great. Um, I'll open it up to questions, but I have a another quick question, which um, for those you know older Americans that don't have internet access and you know. How do we get this information out? As, you know, like a lot of our villages are doing scheduling to get vaccines, you know, because they don't have the internet base. Um, but how do we get, you know, especially ones that, you know, people are calling on the phone, you know, and they're not seeing, you know, the scams like we do if you're, you know, computer based? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, one thing you can do is order the publications and, you know, any individual can order publications or the village could order a bulk order of publications from both the FTC um, link is right up here on this slide. And for CFPB, you can go to consumerfinance.gov. Either way, the publications are free, free shipping. We have them in English and in Spanish. So you could order them and, um, you know, do a mailing to individuals in your village or have them on hand when people start coming back in person to events uh, or to offices and um, people also individuals can have them mailed to their house for free if they want to do that. So that's okay. one way to do it and also putting it in newsletters that you may have. Oh, that's a good idea too. Okay. Um, anybody want to unmute themselves and oh, so Margaret said, I've also heard that it helps if I wear my glasses. <laughs> Hold on. I also heard that one should report scams, fraud, and identity theft to the state attorney general. Is that in lieu of reporting to FTC or in addition, or which one's better? Um, 
Bridget, do you want to answer that? Well, talk, talk about the identity theft, Lisa, because you know that best. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, for identity theft, identitytheft.gov, the advantage of that is it gives you a personal recovery plan and walks you through all the steps you need to take, um, things like how to get your credit report, place a fraud alert or credit freeze, and gives you a personalized uh, plan, including letters you can send to creditors. Um, but generally, if you're reporting a scam or any sort of financial complaint, we usually recommend reporting it both to the federal agency, either the FTC or CFPB, and to your state attorney general. Um, because sometimes there are, the state may have certain protections that are you know, state specific rather than federal. Um, and sometimes the state attorney generals or even local consumer protection offices, some counties have consumer protection offices that have the capacity to individually work your case in a way that the federal agencies may not be able to. So we do but, encourage, yeah, following both. But in, especially with the identity theft though, I mean, you may, with the, the way identity theft.gov now is, um, linked to the IRS, you know, if you're experiencing, particularly for identity theft related problems, um, I strongly recommend using identitytheft.gov because there are just advantages to that, that the information will go more quickly to the IRS um, and, and be connected in ways that it won't be if you file just with the Attorney General. Yeah, that's, and, a, good, oh, sorry, say, that's a good point about identitytheft.gov, especially now at tax time. Um, the identitytheft.gov is now linked with the IRS's portal so that if you file an, a tax related identity theft complaint at identitytheft.gov, you can file the IRS form 14039 directly through identitytheft.gov and it will be sent to the IRS for processing. So it is a very powerful and good resource. Actually, and Iris had a good question. Do you have digital versions of the publications that we can cut and paste into newsletters and upload to our websites? Yes, you can, you can well, speaking for the FTC, you can take, you can t copy and paste the text or you can type the parts that you want because all the text for the FTC is, you know, this is federal information. This is free to use and share however you want. So you don't need to give attribution. Um, you're welcome to. It's nice to say here's information from the FTC and link back to it so people can read more. But you're also welcome to just, you know, copy the portions that are important to you. Um, if you want to, you know, include um, the images and print the PDFs, many of the things that we refer to um, do have like, you know, PDF layouts. Like if you look at the slide that's up now, the centerpiece, the healthcare, I guess it's healthcare scams, um, you can print a PDF of that or drop a PDF of that, you know, into a newsletter you're doing, or you can read the article online and just copy the text and paste that into an article. So um, there are a variety of ways to get and use the information. Most? Yes, that's, 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 that's great. true with CFPB as well. You can take our information. Now, all of our print publications have a PDF version and you can take them. They're not copyrighted like FTC material. The government material is not copyrighted. So you can just take it and plop it into your newsletter and use it. And all the FTC information, all the FTC's consumer information is in English and Spanish. The information like the small business information may not all be in English and Spanish, but all the consumer information is English and Spanish. Oh, great. Um, Carolyn asked a great question. Can you talk a little bit, um, Bridget, about um, how the FTC, you know, does to run down the scammers and put them out of business and, you know, what's the process, you know, a little bit. Um, are most scammers out of the country? Does it make it harder to shut them down? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm in education, I'm in education, not enforcement. So that's, you know, really hard for me to say. I mean, it does, you know, in, in very broad terms, I mean, the FTC does investigations, the, um, the, the, the litigating divisions and the investigations people, you know, there are investigations, we build cases, we build cases. With just the FTC and with other law enforcement agencies. Um, there's a lot of cooperation. 
connection with other agencies and that are into bad guys, you know, as I call them, um, investigating, bringing cases, stopping, shutting companies down, um, stopping bad press. Um, I, I don't know. So I can I, add a little to that. If yeah. you want, um, the can work both yeah. in consumer ID and in the enforcement side. Basically, on the enforcement side, uh, the FTC brings cases under the FTC Act or practice, and they can bring uh, a preliminary injunction to shut down until such time as the court rules on a final order about whether the company should be completely shut down and all of its assets taken away um, if it is fraudulent. So the FTC, like Bridget said, works with other federal law enforcement partners like with the IRS imposter scam, FTC, DOJ and IRS shut down a bunch of call centers. And uh, after that, the number of IRS imposter scam calls went way down, just to give you one example. So just an addendum on that, could you, do you know the percentage of in-country versus out-of-country uh, scams? You don't know. You wouldn't speculate. I, I'd be very curious. That's a good question, Carolyn. Um, Chris asked, um, are the unemployment payment scams handled solely at the state level or do the feds get involved too? That's a good question. I mean, uh, of course, the unemployment benefits are run at a state level, but when it relates to unemployment identity theft, um, then like if somebody's misusing your information in order to get unemployment benefits, which is a lot of what's going on, then the feds would be involved in terms of identitytheft.gov, which is the federal government's you know, one-stop resource for letting people report identity theft and get that personal recovery plan like I was talking about. Right. Um, so that would be the federal involvement in terms of unemployment benefits. But I would definitely, if you have an unemployment benefit related issue, would uh, focus on the state level recourse as well. So anybody else have any other questions, comments before we wrap up? Um, Lisa and Bridget, um, if you wouldn't mind putting your contact information in the chat box, that'd be great if anybody had additional questions, um, if, if you wanna do it, or if you just want us to pass them on to you, we can do that also. Right, did you want us to also put the, I said that I would put the URLs for, um, you know, like where to complain and where to get more information. I did, um, um, I did two of them, I did the bulk order you. one. Um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, um, I did the the consumer finance one, Lisa, that you did on coronavirus. I put the direct link in there, but if you can, um, and I, like I said, I did the bulk order, the, the complaint one I did not put in there. So yeah, that would be great, Bridget, if you can put that in sure. there. Um, do that. And we'll capture the, the chat to send it out to everybody. This has been recorded. So, you know, um, those of you that are with the village, you know, it will be on our website sometime in the next, you know, couple weeks, one week or two. It just takes a little bit of time to download and get it, you know, up and running. Um, so we'd be happy to send that around and, and pass the message on to um, your own villages and, you know, maybe even have some of these. I, I, I wish that we were all together because we could do bulk orders. And if we had an in-person conference, we could, you know, distribute them. But that's a big wish this year so that's not going to happen <laughs> but um i think some of the you know especially i mean identity theft hits home for me i i had my identity taken a couple of years ago it was a very interesting journey um mm -hmm. but and was able to catch it um and it, it's also important to tell folks that they need to check their balance you know their check you know their checking accounts bank statements you know, credit card statements, because when somebody starts charging a dollar here or $5 here, it's a, it's a red flag that they're, they've got your credit card yeah. and um, they're, they're fishing to see whether or not they can, you know, charge things. So um, thank you so much for this very great, um, oh, Ari's on too. 
Um, Ari's checking on us. That's I know, right. Ari, you're sneaking in there. <laughs> I, I know, think I'm I saw glad Clarine checking on me too. <laughs> well, thank you all so much and hope you all have a great weekend. Stay warm. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having us. Time. Thank you. Anytime. Bye now. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.